this far is because he's more than enough. Cause you are more, you are more, you are more than enough. Exceedingly more, we believe you are more, you are more than enough. You are more, you are more, Lord, you are more than enough. You are more than enough. Oh. If you brought me this power, I know because you. word holy words we pray that as the word comes it shall settle in our hearts and convince and convict us and change our lives and redirect us to the way that he wants us to go we love you Lord holy word long preserved for our walk in this world as they resound with God's own heart oh let the ancient words impart words of life and the words of hope please give us strength and help us cope in this world wherever we roam ancient words will guide us home ancient words ever true that's changing me and it's changing With open hearts, oh, let the ancient words impart. Say it again, ancient words that's ever true. See, it's changing me, and it's changing you. Cause we have come with open hearts. Oh, let the ancient words hear. Come and lift it up now. Holy words of our faith and the town. Come on, help me. To this age, see it came to us through his sacrifice. Oh, heed the faithful words. Oh, Christ, holy words say, holy words of our faith, hand it down, hand it down. Yes, to the saints came to us, came to us through his sacrifice. Oh, hear the faithful word, ancient words, ancient words. That's ever to see it's changing me and it's changing you. Oh, we have come as we open hearts. Oh, let the ancient words, ancient words say, ancient words. See, it's ever true. Yes, it is. And change it do. Oh, we have come with 
settle on your heart, but we thank uh, God for the life of Minister Cheko and Minister Clarion and the entire choir. Let's give uh, Razan appreciation for the gift of God over their lives. Amen. Uh, this afternoon, you can't you can see Pastor K here because he is in Denmark, Copenhagen with Pastor Tony uh, because Pastor Tony's wife is being ordained into the ministry today. And so she will not be around, but he will be here tomorrow, I think in the morning. Are, are you with me? Yeah. And how many of us know what happens tomorrow morning? Tomorrow. Birthday. Uh, wh whose birthday? Uh-huh. He's a 777 seven, seven boy. <laughs> and uh, he arrives tomorrow. So don't forget, don't forget him. All right? You know what to do. Appreciate him. You know, the Bible says that those that serve uh, in such wonderful ways, sacrificing their best life for the ministry need to be equally honored and appreciated. So please do that. Let him know we love him and we appreciate him so much. Amen. Uh, but today we have uh, our apostle in London, uh, or uh, uh, let me say Bishop of London, uh, if you go to the Anglican Church, you have a Bishop of London. And if we uh, had uh, that system, then Reverend Jeff Andrews is our Bishop of London. Hallelujah. So he comes with uh, the grace of God and with the authority of God to speak into our lives. And today we are the body of Christ, aren't we? We are the uh, organism of, of, of Christ, the body of and so, look at somebody and tell them, we are the body of Christ. And, you know, don't forget, I am, I am more closer to you than you think. <laughs> and this afternoon, you know, God is going to use his servant to speak into our lives. And I think as he does that, what will happen is that, according to Ephesians, the church will be matured and we will reflect more clearly the image of Jesus Christ in our lives. Uh, Reverend Jeff Andrews is a team leader of the London Baptist Regional uh, uh, Ministry Team, which comprises almost like they oversee about 300 churches in the London municipal area. He took up his uh, post on the 1st of December 2011, and uh, during that this time, uh, he has uh, he actually took. Um, uh, 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 his post on the 20, uh, 2011 and also before he came uh, to take over th that position he was a, a minister uh, a pastor uh, in a church that is not too far from us Perry Rice and uh, for a few years and during that time he saw a development of growing faith in the church it became a multicultural congregation touching many lives, people growing in grace and touching other lives. Uh, prior to Perry Rice, uh, Reverend Jeff Andrews uh, was actually um, a minister in Sheffield as well. She was a, a minister in uh, Sheffield in, uh, and also Woodgreen immediately after he qualified from Spurgeon. 
he is still in contact with Spurgeon's College. And so if you uh, want to be in Spurgeon College or if you want to have any connection, please make sure that you harass him before he leaves. Okay? Um, he is married to Julia, and they, they have two children, Karen and Rachel. So with a special TBC welcome, let us invite Jeff to come and give us the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you very much. Do sit down. Thank you for your welcome. I really appreciate uh, coming here and uh, being part of you and uh, recognizing too that uh, we're part of uh, quite a, uh, a lot of witnesses, certainly Baptist Christians and uh, there are others as well. There are 25,000 Baptist Christians in London. That's remarkable, isn't it? 25,000. You know, see what the Lord did with, um, with 12. <laughs> All right. I brought this cross along. Uh, to say that we're, we're actually a bit more than uh, 25,000. This, this, uh, there were two crosses, these made of wood, uh, and uh, they were taken to the Baptist Assembly this year. Uh, and uh, churches were invited to come along and write the name of their church on, on the cross. So it's covered front and back with the names of churches. Your name is on there a couple of times because uh, Pastor Stephen and uh, Pastor uh, Cynthia and uh, Kingsley... Uh, I think wrote the name of the church on on here, and uh, this cross is uh, these crosses are being taken around the country just as a um, a symbol of you know our unity in Christ as Baptist Christians, but also a symbolic way of saying to us, look, we want the cross to be at the centre of who we are, the centre of our churches, the Lordship of Jesus at the centre of our churches, the Lordship of Jesus at the centre of our association, and the Lordship of Jesus at uh, the center of our union. And I want to pray. I want to pray for our, uh, our churches, but I want to begin by praying for you. Uh, and and uh, I'd like to, to pray for all the leadership in the, in the church here, and I'd like the pastors to stand. And the, uh, those who know they're in leadership, call leadership, or elders, or, or call leaders. And if you if you just like to stand, I'd just like to pray with you. I'm just aware of the fact that, um, you know, as an association, uh, our job is to, if you like, add value to what local churches are doing. You know, we're not here to uh, take away from what churches are doing, but to add to them. And I'm aware that we have a relationship with you at uh, TBC, uh, which we, 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 we see as precious. We also recognize that you have been through a period of challenge, and there are challenges ahead, but we're excited as you are about Oasis House. And we're excited about various other things that we want to progress like you do. Uh, and we want to pray for your leaders as they seek to uh, lead you and guide you. And I want to pray for the church as a whole. And then I'll just pray more widely for our union. So let's pray together. And Spirit of God, we thank you that you're present amongst us. We thank you for your promise to be here. We thank you for the gospel that is so precious to us and for the reality of Christ dwelling amongst us. We thank you that we are the temple of your Holy Spirit and you are present amongst us when we are gathered together. And I do pray for the pastors and the leaders that are standing here. And I pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit will rest upon them. I pray, Lord, that they may be encouraged in their ministry. I pray, Lord, that they will be protected in their ministry. And I pray, Lord, for wisdom from you, from a, for a sense of the closeness of Jesus in all that they do. And I pray, Lord, as the church is led here, there may be a clear vision of where you want that church to be and how you want it to be in the places that you put it. So I ask your blessing and help, and I pray that Christ may be at the center of the lives of the leaders here. I pray that Christ might be at the center of the life of the church here. I pray, Lord, for the association as we seek to bless this church and they are a blessing to us, that we might have Christ at the center of our association. I pray, too, for our union. Lord, may it be used with all your people throughout this land to be salt and light, to be that uh, 
witness to the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ expressed on the cross and through the resurrection. Lord, we pray, may the Lordship of Jesus be at the center of who we are. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Sit down. Friends, I, I come, you know, representing the London Baptist Association and it's a, you know, it's, it's a job that I wonder whether I would have taken if I knew what I was letting myself in for. <laughs> um, certainly very, very different from being the minister of a local church. I know pastor at work in a local church. I was pastor for 30 years before I, I did this job. Uh, and I look back to the sort of little inner city church in in Sheffield where I was working and then to uh, North London in Wood Green and then my 17 years at Perry Rise Baptist Church. I look back at that time with a kind of affection uh, and sometimes a kind of longing as well. <laughs> uh, you know, it's, it's just a joy when you were doing the dedications, you know. I, I did many of those. Uh, you don't do many as a, a regional minister. <laughs> uh, are those kind of things, and you sort of see that as church life. And it's a, it's it's the life of the church that I, increasingly inspires me. It's what we are about that inspires me in the work of the association. You know, as a pastor, my greatest desire was to see people embrace the gospel of Jesus Christ. You know. Yes, you wanted people to feel welcome in your church. That's one thing we worked hard at, to make the place a place where people wanted to come. You, you wanted people to, to, to know you as their friend, and you wanted people to know that you would support them, you know, come what may. You weren't going to lean on them. But did you desire for them to know Jesus? Not because you wanted more people in the, in the seats or more members on the books, but because you know that the, the gospel of Jesus Christ has power to change people. So we want to do that. Now as a regional minister in the London, the London Baptist Association as a team leader, that's my desire. It's a simple desire to see people come to know Jesus, to enable the churches to be that through you know, promoting unity amongst the churches, promoting mission amongst the churches, giving leadership to the churches, and celebrating what God has brought from all over the world uh, to London. And just sharing that for the sake of the good news of the kingdom of God. I want to read to you from uh, Paul's letter to Ro the Romans, uh, the first uh, uh, 17 verses, and then we're going to spend some time just uh, reflecting on those and what they are saying to us today. These are the things that God has put on my heart, and I pray the Spirit of God will touch your heart as I speak. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God. The gospel he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures regarding his son, who as to his earthly life was a descendant of David, and who through the spirit of holiness was appointed the son of God in power by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. Through him we receive grace and apostleship to call all the Gentiles to faith and obedience for his name's sake. And you also are among those Gentiles who are called to belong to Christ, to all in Rome who are loved by God and called to be his holy people. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you because your faith is being reported all over the world. God whom I serve in my spirit in preaching the, the, the gospel of the, his Son is my witness how constantly I remember you in my prayers at all times. And I pray that now at last God's will, the, 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 by God's will the way may be open for me to come to you. I long to see you so that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to make you strong. That is, that you and I may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith. I do not want you to be unaware, brothers and sisters, that I plan many times to come to you, but I have been prevented from doing so until now in order that I might have a harvest among you, just as I've had amongst other Gentiles. I'm obligated both to Greeks and non-Greeks, both to the wise and the foolish. That is why I am so eager to preach the gospel also to you who are in Rome. I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. For in the gospel the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just, it is, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. 
Well, as I prepared for uh, coming to you today, uh, God placed on my heart that verse, uh, verse uh, uh, 16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. But also as I read further on and, and read, reread the, the passage from the beginning, I was struck by those words, set apart for the gospel, the centrality of the gospel of Jesus Christ to who the, all that we are. And I've been guided to God, God to these, these verses, and I just want to bring them to you again. You know, there's an English proverb that says, familiarity breeds contempt. Uh, and it's true even within the church that we get so used to reading passages that we actually fail to understand the significance of them. You know, we say, well, I know that bit. You know, I've read that bit before. You kind of skip over it. And then, you know, the Bible has a habit of shouting at you again out of a verse that you think you knew. And Romans is a book like that because that's one of those books that we can become very familiar with the gospel uh, passage with. And I want to pick up some of the truths out of this passage today. I want to start by that whole sense of being set apart for the gospel, having the gospel at the center of who we are, dictating how our life is operating as, as disciples of Jesus Christ. Paul introduces himself to the Romans. Paul, a servant of Christ, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God. And I want you to consider those words for a moment. A servant of Christ, says Paul, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God. The apostle Paul saw his life wrapped up in serving the purposes of God. That was what he was called to do and to be. Everything about his life was wrapped up and circumscribed, if you like, by the gospel of Jesus Christ. And his function was to call people to obedience to the purposes of God revealed in the gospel. He just saw that's what life was about. That's how life was to be. He had a calling and he structured the whole of the life, all of his life around that calling. He was a disciple of Jesus Christ, and that was the most important thing. And therefore, everything else was kind of secondary to that, or at least served that. And that's how Jesus, and that's how Paul was. But, you know, whilst we may not be called to the same ministry as Paul, there is a challenge here for us as Christian people to see ourselves as those whose lives are ordered by the life and teaching of Jesus Christ and who are centered on that. You know, there's a danger, always a danger, that actually being a Christian becomes a kind of spare time interest, you know? That actually we, we live our lives uh, day by day in the jobs that we do, the people that we meet, the sort of social life we have. We, we kind of do that and we stick a bit of God into it, you know? <laughs> oh, well, I come to church on Sunday or I may try and find a bit of time to pray, rather than actually saying, God, you know, I realize that wherever I am, whatever I am doing, I am a disciple of Jesus Christ first and foremost. You know, and, and that my life is kind of circumscribed by that. And, and, and therefore, you know, in the place where I work, yeah, you know, I, w I work to earn some money to pay my bills and that kind of stuff. But actually that services me, not just as a human being, not just as a, a person within a family and, and paying bills. It actually enables me to, that's the place where I am for Jesus. And Jesus is the person that, uh, that guides my life. You know, one of the joys that I have as a regional minister is to find um, churches for people who are, you know, training for ministry uh, and uh, you know I, I, I'm at the point these days of saying to people that uh, being called to the ministry doesn't guarantee a full-time job at the end of it uh, being trained for ministry is that your calling is your calling you may find that you're in a situation where you might be paid for that but you may find that actually you've just got to fulfill your calling and find a way of doing that um, and and uh, I'm excited sometimes by the people that I meet with who say, well, I don't want, you know, want full-time pay. I'm quite happy to do a bit of part-time work. But if you find me, you know, if it's a church got a house and I can live in the house, I'll serve them and I will find uh, income ourselves. And you find husbands and wives who work to do that. Uh, and that's just exciting to see that kind of stuff happening. You know, you know the Apostle Paul was called to be minister to the Gentiles. I am so grateful that he didn't wait for a full-time position to come up where he could do it. 
He just kind of went out and did it, didn't he? You know, and he found ways, both through his own skill as a tent maker, but also through the gifts uh, that other churches were making to him to make that happen. His whole life was wrapped around that. And now we have got to kind of get hold of that. That when God called you and me to be a disciple of Jesus, he did it for a purpose, that we might serve his purposes and uh, that we might find joy in serving his purposes, that we might find that we are people that, that actually have a role within the world called by him. Jesus said that we were salt and light. Salt and light. Now, I mean, if we turned all the lights off in here, there'd be a bit of a panic for a moment or two. Um, hopefully not too much of a panic, because there's no windows. There's a few at the back here. Before I, We would just not know where we were. And then somebody would turn the lights on and we go, oh, great. <laughs> uh, you know, I'm, you know I, I, I'm one of those people who, I, I, I like the light. I get a bit confused at night sometimes. But, you know, light makes such an important part of our life. I, I was on holiday recently and I drove into a multi-story car park and the lights had failed in the car park. And they're not the nicest of places in the world anyway, are they? <laughs> multi-story cars. Believe me, when there's no light on in them. <laughs> They're quite eerie. We actually drove out. <laughs> we said, we'll find another place to park. We're not going to park here. It doesn't look good. You know, we are light in the world as the people of God. You know, there are some dark places in this world. And actually, as the disciples of Jesus Christ, shining the light of Jesus Christ, we can bring some light into the world. We are people who bring flavor into the world. You know, I'm an Englishman, and Englishmen and English people are just known for their blandness. You know, bland food. You know, you know I, I found, found out recently that chica, chicken tikka masala had become the most popular dish in the UK, you know. Um, clearly, we were so longing for something with a bit of tang in it. <laughs> That's over these last 40-odd uh, years. But, you know, we, we like some flavor. Uh, you know, when I, English people don't have much flavor in food, but we've, we've had people from all over the world come and bring us flavor. I was reading a book by a woman called Kate Fox called Watching the English. It actually says one of the things about Englishness is the way that uh, actually we experiment with all kinds of food. You won't find many different restaurants in other places in the world, but in England you'll find, you know, Italian and Indian and <coughs> Caribbean and African, all those kind of things you'll find there. Flavor is important to us. And you know, salt, salt is one of those things that gives flavor. And we are people who give flavor to life. We're not so salty that it makes it, you want to spit it out. We give flavor. And, and when you're set apart for the gospel of Jesus Christ, that is our role. To, to, to be something, not just stuck in a church, in a barn, waiting for the end to come but actually being people that we bring something positive to the world that God loves, the world that God is delighted to, to redeem in his son Jesus Christ. And we're part of those purposes. And that's what Paul saw. He didn't say, I'm a disciple and therefore I'll gather a few disciples around and we'll go into a corner somewhere and just be disciples. He said, I'm a disciple of Jesus Christ called to be a disciple in the world, to bear witness to the light of Christ. And he talks about the gospel that's been revealed. And this is one of those things that I, I kind of feel needs to come across to us again. A recognition of the reality of what we believe, the historical reality of what we believe, the fact that it's all happened. First of all, it was all promised. You know, the, the, the Old Testament prophets, prophets looked down the years and, and they, they saw the kind of mess that uh, Israel was in at the time. They saw the disobedience of the people. They saw what it led to in terms of them going into exile and being taken away from the land that they'd been given. And they hoped for a, a devotion in people. They hoped for a different kind of world, a different kind of creation. They longed for that and the Holy Spirit wrote that into their hearts and into their message. And they saw a day. They saw a day when there would be a new king. You know, in David's line. They saw a day when God would be close to people. They saw a day when, when, you know, there wouldn't be a time when somebody said to somebody else, know the Lord. Everybody would know me from the great to the least because God would dwell in the hearts of people. He'd take out a heart of stone and put in a heart of flesh, the Bible says. He, he talked about a time when, you know, when the lion would lie down with the lamb. 
He talked about a time when, you know, if you look at Isaiah 63, I think it's in, in you know, a new, new Jerusalem there, where, where, you know, people would live good long lives, where children wouldn't die, when people would enjoy the fruit of their labor. These great, great passages of promise within the Old Testament. The prophets saw those. And Paul saw that all of those prophetic words found their fulfillment in Jesus Christ. That Jesus is, is the embodiment of the promises of God. Now, Paul says all the promises God, of God find their yes in Jesus Christ. And, you know, Jesus is declared to be the Son of God through his resurrection. The gospel's been revealed. The purposes of God established in him. And we are people of that gospel and we stand on that reality. And we need to be reminded of it. Some simple words. Jesus has come. Jesus is risen. Jesus will appear again. You know, that's at the heart of what we believe. We believe that there was a time when footprints were made in the sand of Palestine. There was a time when a man ascended a hill carrying a cross, was nailed to that cross. There was a time when a stone was rolled away and a risen Lord Jesus appeared. There was a time when Jesus stood on the mountainside with his disciples and was taken into glory. Those things have happened, my friend. And history will not be the same again. And, and there are times when we, we forget that. There are times that we fail to live in the light of the resurrection of Jesus and his lordship. You know, we watch our news on the televisions, we read our papers, we, and we discuss with one another, where will it all end? Where will it all end? Will there be an Islamic state that takes over the world? Will Russia become a power again and we'll go back to the days of the old the, the world? Will America suddenly turn really bad? <laughs> And take us all over because that's the only way they can feel safe. Where will it all end? My friend, it will end when Christ appears. It's written in the book. Okay? It's not in the hands of whatever state that you would want to say. It's not in the hands of the circumstances that we, we could imagine and discuss and worry about. The reality is that Christ is going to appear again. Because he's come already. He's come already. And that is the heart of what we're about. And my friends, people might think we're crazy, and often do. People think I'm crazy, you know. <laughs> I play a bit of golf, you know, don't play very well. And I play often with people who aren't kind of people who, 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 who have faith. And when they find out, you know, halfway, through, halfway around the kind of golf course, they'll say, well, what do you do for a living? So that always ends up with an interesting conversation. And it's always fascinating what people say to me, how interesting. And you are not one who say, do they really think it's interesting? Or do they really know what to say? What kind of a nutter is this? <laughs> you know? What are we about? What are we about here? You know, I, I, I think that uh, we... Um, the, 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 the fact of, of what we're, we're about is, is, is that Jesus has come. Jesus has risen. Jesus is Lord. And we live in the light of that historical reality. And we're here to live our lives in the, sight, in the light of that reality. Our what lives are determined by the fact of what Jesus has done. So we say, well, Jesus, if you're a Lord, Jesus, if you're alive, well, what are you saying to me today about my life and what I'm about? What are you saying to me about these kind of things? How, am I, how is my life going to be ordered by these things? The gospel's revealed in Jesus, and it's been finally delivered revealed. We have to live our life in concert with those values that he revealed in the gospel. And then we find that Paul writes those glorious verses in verse 16. I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it's the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. You know, I want to just talk about a couple of things with regard to those verses. First of all, the power of God. Have you been touched by the power of God? Do you believe in the power of the gospel? Have you been touched by the reality 
of the gospel. As a 13-year-old boy, I went on a school trip. Okay? It was quite exciting. We went up to Earl's Court to hear Billy Graham. It was a Christian union at the school I was at. 1966. Can you remember 1966? Some of you might. <laughs> yeah, it was the year of the World Cup. I, watched, I couldn't watch the extra time. I remember that. <laughs> Well, this was a bit earlier than that. We went up, and uh, my mother had said to me, don't you go forward. And I was a good boy, and I didn't sort of uh, argue. But, you know, I don't remember anything about that, very much about that. I remember going. I remember going up on the coach. A lot of the roads that are there now weren't built. <laughs> it took longer to get up from Gillingham to, <laughs> Gillingham to London than it does now. We went up on a coach. We went there. But I found I had to go forward. I had to respond to Jesus. You know, there was something, it was very simple. I wasn't grown, didn't understand everything about it, but I felt a just touch on my life, come and follow. And I went. And because of the nurture of the church and the, the closeness of God, I can say that during my life and continues to happen, I know Jesus. And it's a reality, you know. It's the power of God that's there. And the gospel of Jesus Christ has touched my life and has changed me. You know, I can't think about what life would be like without Jesus. Because I've walked with Jesus, and he's walked with me. That's probably a better way of putting it. He's walked with me down my life. And, and it, it's been good. And it's been good in the bad times. Okay? Twenty-odd years ago, uh, um, we were in half term. It was half term week. And we'd been to see my wife's younger sister. We were staying up in the north, up in near Matlock. And there was a telephone call. And the telephone call said that Julia's elder sister had been killed in an accident. She was 46. It was a freak accident. She was walking in the hills in Snowdonia. She'd fallen over her rucksack on with a, a thermos flask at the top. And as she'd fallen over it, it had broken her neck. She died. She had a 10-year-old boy. Her other children were older. But I remember that day. You know those kind of things? You never forget them. And uh, my brother-in-law had phoned and said, I don't think I can drive back with uh, the boy. Um, can you come? And can you come over to Snowdonia? So my wife and I got in the car and we drove over to Snowdonia. And we met him at the youth hostel where we were staying and we drove back. <laughs> Middle of the night. You don't forget those experiences. Where was God? Where was God in all that? He was right beside us. He walked with us. He walked with my brother-in-law. You, know, you can't explain things. There are no questions that you can answer in that way. But the one thing I knew, and I remember at the funeral, people say, where was God? God was with us. Christian family, we were Christians. And we were, we were together, and we, we were seeking God. He was present with us. That is the power of the gospel. Paul says, it's no longer I that lives with Christ who lives in me. And I've walked my life, and I've, I've had a number of sad situations like that that I've had to go through. But God has been with me, because there's a power in this gospel that, uh, that I believe. Um, you know, my friends, if we admit our need of Jesus, confess him as Lord, we are not <laughs> signing a form. We're opening our lives to the very presence of God. Life is changed. And that brings me to talk about salvation. That's what salvation is about. You know, in the church, we've rather unhelpfully uh, talked about salvation in, in otherworldly terms. You know, salvation is the kind of insurance payout that you get when you die. We speak about it as, as going to heaven, as kind of salvation as pie in the sky when you die. We're also in, in a habit of speaking about salvation in terms of our kind of souls, 
rather than our bodies, you know, the complete salvation of who we are. The Bible doesn't speak in those terms. Firstly, salvation is a this-worldly experience. That doesn't take away from, you know, you know, the verse that we sang, you know, 10,000 years and then forevermore kind of thing. It doesn't take away from that. But it says it begins now. My friends, we're miserable people if we're just here to wait to die so that we can enjoy God. You know, that's not what it says. <laughs> it's not what it says. We have a down payment by the Holy Spirit, by the power of the gospel in us. And, and, and to that extent, we should be expecting the transformation, transforming touch of God. Now, when Jesus spoke to Zacchaeus in Luke 19, he didn't say, after Zacchaeus made his great thing, you know, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that, pay back fourfold and all that kind of thing. He didn't say, to, didn't say to Zacchaeus, salvation will come to this house. He says, salvation today, salvation has come to this house. And when the Apostle Paul speaks about salvation, he talks about us being transformed from one degree to another. That there is a process that's taking place. My friends, I'm not perfect, but I'm better than I was. Because God is at work in me to willing to work his good purposes. That's the reality of the gospel that we've embraced my friends, we need to get hold of this truth that salvation has begun in us. Every touch from God, whether it be of comfort, healing or challenge, is a touch of salvation. We need to believe that God is working in us and that he seeks continue to work. Sometimes, you know, I was at an induction yesterday over in North London and, and I was, and I remember as I was talking, I sensed that, that feeling, you know that feeling you go, God is going to move. <laughs> God is about, the breeze of the Spirit is around. Uh, you, can, you can tell that. I said, yeah. You know, I honestly believe that God can do far more than we can ask and imagine <laughs> in the life of the churches. And then I thought to myself, why, why is it that it doesn't happen? And my friends, sometimes it's just that we're in the way. We just get in the way. The way that we want to be the church, the way that we want to do it, the way that we squeeze God into our kind of way of doing things means that the things that God could really do, we stop him from doing. The fact is that that salvation is present to transform us. And you as an individual here today, I don't know where you are sitting with God at the moment. I don't know whether you've experienced that salvation. My friend, if, you, if you've never embraced Jesus, give it a go. There are pastors down here waiting to just tell you how to do that and how to know that. But if you're a Christian here, and there are many of us around, many Christians around, for whom it's all become rather academic, I believe in Jesus. There's a song that they sing, you know, you don't buy me flowers anymore, you know. And it says, you know, the love's gone out of the relationship. You know, we kind of, something, it's not, there's no sparkle there anymore. It happens as Christians. The reality is, my friends, that salvation is something that continues to work within us. You don't have to wait till you die to enjoy salvation. You can embrace the message of Jesus Christ again. And just a quick word on this whole business of the salvation, the complete salvation of our bodies. You know, the trouble is when we just think it's all about spirits, we don't think too much of who we are as people. And we don't think too much about the creation that God has made. God made the world and said it was good. And God made you and I as human beings. Did you just appear here? Did somebody else make you? We are the creatures of God. And God sees us as precious. And whilst our bodies are not all that they might be, and whilst that decay which is part of the fallenness of humanity is a reality... The word of the scripture is that we will be all made new. You know, just as Christ has been raised from the dead, so will we be raised from the dead. Yeah, we all ask the question, what will it look like? And what will it be like? And Paul says, you know, just as we have a physical body, we have a spiritual one. And we long for the renewal of the things that God has made. And that's what God is working towards. So let's look after ourselves, if you like. Let's look after the world that God has made and have a positive attitude to it. That's what salvation is a word. What do I, what do I, what's the message that I want to leave with you really today? 
You're made for a purpose to live before the world the gospel of Jesus. Get hold of your purpose. Let your little light shine, you know. And bring light to the world. Be confident in the gospel. Jesus has come, Jesus has died, Jesus is risen. Yes, we're waiting for the revelation of Christ, but an awful lot of revelation has happened already. Walk in the light of the good news you have received. Receive the power of God. Reprieve the power of the gospel. Embrace the salvation of yours. And again, if you've not received Christ, I've never regretted a moment of receiving him. You know, to know Jesus, there is no greater thing. Let's pray together. Lord, I do thank you for the gospel of Jesus Christ. I, know, I thank you for the difference it's made to my life. I, I stand here before these people knowing I'm not perfect, knowing all my foibles and failures, but thanking you that, that, that in, in my life you have walked with me. Lord, I thank you for the way you walk with us in the dark times. And Lord, I pray for any who are going through dark times at the moment. Pray, Lord, that your spirit present with us. Yes, Lord, present with us now will touch the hearts of those who are struggling. But Lord, I don't know those here who may have, who just don't know you, never really embraced you. Lord, I pray that as they are with us in this place and your spirit is present, will you just stir up their hearts and say, well, there might be something in this, something that they can embrace too. And Lord, I pray for those in this congregation whose love may have grown cold, who have not experienced the power of the gospel or the reality of salvation for a, a little while, for whatever reason, for circumstances or otherwise. I pray, Lord, that your spirit right now will come and touch them with that sense that you're still there, you still love them, and they're still part of your purposes. Lord, I give your church to you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jeff.